So, Joe Seeliger, welcome back to uh, to the History Center. Today, um, we've got some more things to cover as it relates to your career and your work in DeKalb County. I'd like to start with the proposed presidential parkway, now called Freedom Parkway, that you were... Um, Actually, it's now called the John Lewis Freedom Parkway. It is now John Lewis, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so do you mind talking a little bit about the... Um, it has quite a history. The, uh, yeah. The, it all started back in the 1960s. They wanted to build the Department of Transportation, which I'll refer to as the DOT, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to build a freeway from downtown Atlanta out to the area now as the, where we have the Stone Mountain Expressway. And they got started. It immediately was a matter of controversy because the 485, the name of that highway, was to go through East Atlanta and Central DeKalb, mm -hmm. Decatur, uh, beyond Decatur, and on to link up with the Stone Mountain Expressway. And immediately, uh, protests started to come out. Uh, at that time, President, uh, the governor of Virginia was Jimmy Carter, and he had a director of highways named Bert Lance. Uh, in 1970, uh, 1975, just before he re completed his run for election in 1976, they agreed to stop the building of the parkway. But in the process, it was pretty late because the freeway had cleared, DOT had cleared nearly uh, 300 yards wide swash of land going from downtown Atlanta all the way out to Moreland Avenue and a good portion of the land on the east uh, in DeKalb County. So it, so it ended at that point and that was kind of an eyesore. The city of Atlanta talked about the idea of doing this center and, and to build a park there, but they couldn't get their act together. Well, Jimmy Carter went to Washington and he came back from Washington. And so he had, he wanted to build a presidential library here in Atlanta. And so to cut a deal with the Department of Transportation and Emory University, they agreed to build the, uh, build the Carter Library on that blanket, blanket land, but the DOT was going to be able to build a freeway from downtown Atlanta going across Moreland through two areas of parks, Candler Park, Olmwood Park, and what we call the Old State Park now, which runs parallel with House Leon, and called the Presidential Parkway. Immediately all of the uh, immediately all of the neighbors got into it, got into a fight, and the litigation started. And this would be in 1981. Uh, the first fights were in the federal court claiming that there was an inadequate environmental impact statement filed by the DOT that was denied by the United States District Court. Then the next litigation was in downtown Atlanta, and it was the issue about the park plans, which will be a part of my issue at some later time. The city, uh, the DOT asked the, uh, asked the city of Atlanta to grant title to all the parks, Candle Park, Oldwood Park, and part of the Olmstead Park. And so they, uh, by a vote of 13 to 12, the city council agreed to transfer those uh, parks to the Department of Transportation to build the presidential parkway. And, that, uh, and, and along that, there was a decision made not just by Judge Williams, Osgood Williams in Fulton Court. He had two decisions to make. First of all, the way the voting went. It was 13 to 12, and one of the major majority vote was Marvin Arrington, who was that time vice mayor and had the deciding vote. It came to light that Marvin Arrington had a, had a subcontract to the business, and it was subcontract with Chevy, uh, Shepherd, uh, thank you, uh, Shepherd uh, Construction, who was actually had the contract on building the freeway. He was to provide trucks. So he really had an obvious conflict of interest. So on that basis, caution attacked the vote because of that conflict of interest. They also said that, uh, they also said 
that uh, he shot for construction, which is one of the most bizarre cases you've ever seen, and I don't even know all the facts of the case. They were declared criminals because of the way they had negotiated a prior highway contract, and caution people argued, well, they had to disqualify him, uh, Shepard, from being a contractor on him. That's kind of subsidiary to the other issue. So it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, well, that wasn't really much of a conflict of interest, so we're going to allow the, the city council to vote on it, on the issue of the parks. And then they, but then the Supreme Court disqualified, upheld the disqualification of Shepard Construction because of their prior criminal record, if you will. So the case goes back to city council. And the city council this time votes again 13 to 12, again, to transfer those parks to the Department of Transportation. That occurred in early 1985. I was elected to the judge of the Superior Court in January, it took office on January 1st, 1985. Things were apparently stagnating, and I didn't know anything about the case. I didn't pay, really pay much attention to it, except, of course, I read the newspapers, but that's about it. But then one day, Judge Castellani shows up in my office, and he says, Chuck, I hate to do this to you, but I have to turn the presidential parkway case over to you. And I said, well, why, Bob? And he said, well, you know, my son goes to Padilla, and they've been demonstrating against the parkway, all of them, including my son, and I'm afraid I have a conflict of interest when I hear the case. And I said, okay, you're right. So I received the case. Again, nothing much happened for a while. And then in June, Bill Joy, a former classmate of mine at Emory University, showed up from the Attorney General's office with a couple other lawyers. And he said, well, Judge, he wanted to say Chuck, but he couldn't say that, so he said, Judge, we have, uh, we have now had title for these parks for the building of the Presidential Parkway. And we want to do a quick take. And that's a function of allow them, they can, to take the parks because they have a legal right to do that and because the parks are going to be used, the construction is going to be used for public purpose, that they can and then pay money into court. And I made myself some problems with that. I mean, these are parks that belong to the city, but something didn't sound right to me. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I won't allow the court take, but I will schedule a hearing on, on the condemnation of the parkway in about two weeks. And I'll invite, we'll notify everybody, we'll notify the city of Atlanta, DeKalb County, Caution, the contractors, and we'll have a hearing, a preliminary status hearing to find out what's going on. That week I just tried my first medical malpractice case on a Thursday morning. That afternoon, I asked, him to, I asked the parties to meet at four o'clock. And so at four o'clock, he went out on the bench, and I had a little boardroom at that time. The place was jammed, filled with everybody. People were lining the walls. There were uh, lawyers from the city, lawyers from Caution, lawyers from uh, the city of Atlanta, who also took a lot of, and were going to participate a lot in the arguments in this case. So I asked them, well, I'm here on the status of condemnation. Do you have any opinions on this? Well, they all did. And by the time it got there, I was really confused. So I said, all right, because this is a, because there is a parkway in construction, I feel because of the magnitude of this case, if I rule one way or the other, it's likely there could be an injunction granted. So I am going to grant a temporary injunction pending the outcome of the hearing, that's what we're going to have in two months. So I'll ask you to be, prepare your briefs and get them ready. We'll schedule a hearing in two months. And they excuse themselves. The hearing began, again, it was a full courtroom, and I listened to it, listened to all the sides of argument of the case. Heard argument, even took a little bit of evidence. 
And I said, all right, I'll take it under advisement. And so I started looking at the briefs. It took me a while, but I did come to, some, to a conclusion. And the conclusion was this. Number one, the city had no power to get rid of the parks. They could not convey them. And why couldn't they convey them? Well, because they were being occupied. And if a park plan has been donated to them by third parties, and these were donated to the city to third parties, you cannot use it for any other purpose as long as it's an active, it's an active park. You cannot convey it to anyone. So that was number one. And then number two, you have to, if you're, if you are, and these, and these parks are abandoned, you've got to give the previous owners an opportunity to reacquire the land. That's what the law requires. But you know, these parks were donated, oh, 60 years earlier, and down if those people, people were alive, so they couldn't very well convey it back to the original owners. And, so, and then third, as ba so on that basis, the city had no right to convey those parks for the purposes of the freeway. But then the DRJ argued, they came in and had argued, and they did argue, that, well, we, it doesn't make any difference. We have the right to condemn parks for public use uh, under the uh, the, as long as it's being used for public purposes, we have absolute uh, condemnation power to take those parks. And I said, no, you don't. These are public lands, but the statute specifically says condemnations can take place on private property, but not on public, does not say public property. And so I said, no, you can't condemn. And so therefore, since you can't, since you can't, build the parkway under its present plan without taking those parks by granting a permanent injunction on the parkway. The news coverage was interesting. Mm -hmm. I, uh, everybody from the governor to the mayor, Andrew Young, to the city councilmen, to the lawyers, to the DOT, the contractors, all said I was wrong. The DOJ had power to take those parks. And there's our editorials in the newspaper. The first ones, the uh, Constitution would endorse me to be, uh, to be reelected just six months before I started saying nasty things about it. And I'm, my uh, operating judiciously and improperly and so on, and I went up to the Supreme Court. One person who was happy about it, however, was Maynard Jackson. Because Maynard was, at this time, mayor, and Andrew Long was a prior mayor, and he'd been already advocating against the parks all of this time, uh, the freeway all of this time. But, and he was quoted in the paper as well. And I said, it's nice that Maynard would say something nice about it, but that's really not important. So I went to the Supreme Court, and to the shock of everyone, the Supreme Court upheld my decision by four to three. It's a close decision. But they said four to three. And my injunction was held and I stopped the parkway. For two years, things kind of held in the bands. And then the legislature got active. And they passed a new law dealing with the condemnation of public properties. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, and it was really a strange system. What they would have is a public property, property condition that would make a decision of whether the DOT could condemn the property. They, uh, and that commission is basically the elected public office holders, the Secretary of State, and I think a tax commissioner, and a lieutenant governor, uh, and the like. And they would hear argument from the DOT, and then they would vote on it. There is no provision for due process, no place for anyone to oppose the park to be heard. There was no, there was no provision for hearings or being represented by counsel or even saying anybody who has property adjoining where the condemnation is taking place could raise any objection. 
So they summarily granted it and the case came back before me. And I looked at it and then I heard that there was a second motion and the motion was by the Department of Transportation, not the Department of Transportation for Caution. They said they'd like to mediate this thing, bring in a mediator. And they wanted me to order a mediation. But I heard arguments on both sides, and, and I was really angry at that particular hearing. And I said, uh, you know, they're, they're mediating a conflict over in Africa between Ethiopia, and I've forgotten the adjoining country. They've been in war at war for 18 years, and the Carter, the Carter Commission, are, are negotiating, trying to negotiate a settlement in this case. And we can't people can't get people to negotiate about a road to be built and drew in a parks. I wonder who's really civilizing this thing. Bingo. Well, they appealed. They appealed my order to. Mediate. They appeal my order condemning the, the due process argument concerning the um, the uh, concerning the new procedure, and they and they ordered me. They wanted me to be recused by the United States, Georgia Supreme Court. So it went up to the Supreme Court, and they ruled in my favor. And they were, first of all, they held that the process set up by the legislature was okay. They didn't give them necessarily give a reason. Second, they said, no, you can't reduce, uh, recuse Judge, I cannot recuse Judge Seeliger. He shouldn't have said it, but it doesn't mean he was biased in making rulings in this case. The third, the one that I won on was, I can order a mediation, and the Supreme Court was very specific. It said, I could order a mediation as a judge. I couldn't order them to settle the case, but I can order them to engage in mediation. So it came back down. I looked at the order and said, okay, with all the parties here in the courtroom. I guess we're ready now to uh, I, I know that I have the power to order you to mediate, but I just don't think it would happen. Nobody's really interested in it, and I don't think it, I think it would be a, an exercise of futility. So I'm not going to order a mediation. Uh, but we're going to set it down for trial in about three months. So I want you to get all the information together. Just let, you're going to have to tell me if you want a jury trial on this or not. On the, and the issue will be. I guess the issue was going to be, and you have to frame that issue for me, among other things, does the, does the DOJ have the power under eminent domain to take this property, and is it in the best interest of the community to have that property, or other issues? And at that point, the representative from the DOT stood up and he said, Judge, we'd like that mediation. I just felt that out of my chair. could not believe it. So, all right, I'll find a mediator and we'll set it up. Parties will share the cost of the mediation. And so I left the bench and uh, I got in touch with uh, some mediation organizations and they recommended a fellow by the name of Michael Keating from Rhode Island. I did not want to mediate her locally because this thing was so politically hot. And I figured that whatever, whatever would happen, they cast dispersion on him said the mediator was local. So I brought him in and my competing, as I say, was from Rhode Island. And they came down and they started to mediate. Uh, we seem to be making progress. I was not privy to what was going on in the mediation, but they came down for a week. Everything was stopped until we got a result or a failure from the mediation. Then a month later, Michael Keating came back down again and they started working on it. The sad aspect of it is that Michael Keating had come down with cancer, but he was in remission. And he said, I'd like to continue with the mediation. I said, please do, if you can do it, I'd love to have it. So he went and they continued to mediate. And then I got a call from Mr. Keating. He said, Judge, I'd like to speak to you. I said, okay, come on over. So we sat in chambers. He said, the parties are going to ask for a continuance of the trial. You know, you've got to sit for about 
a month from now. And I said, yeah, well, if they ask me and they need it, I'll, I'll probably grant it. And uh, he said, don't do it. I said, what do you mean, don't do it? He said, they're making progress. They're at one point where they can resolve this one issue, and I'm convinced they can do it. They have to do it now. Because if you if you allow them to leave, all the negotiations we're not at this point will break down. You've got to keep them in the room with me. And so the parties came before me in open court. They both stood up and said, Your Honor, we'd like a continuation of the mediation process and delay the trial. And I looked at him and I said, Okay. No, I deny them. We're getting ready for trial in about three weeks. I expect you to be ready if you cannot resolve it. So go back to the table, or otherwise get ready for trial. And they left. Newspapers, the AJC at that point did an editorial and said, maybe it's time, instead of replacing the building parkway, that we just replace the judge. Really? How unkind, I thought, but anyway. So, they started to mediate. And then about a week later, they came into my office. They asked, and they said, Your Honor, we have worked it out. They said, tell me what you're going to do. And they said, basically, we're going to build a two-way roadway where the proposed freeway was going to be, and it's going to, the rest of the land is going to be ceded to become a park. And uh, the park, of course, the Transnational Library is already built, and so that's not an issue in this case. And we will transfer title to the city of Atlanta but once we have camped after we've conveyed the park. And I just took a sigh of relief. I said, all right, present me an order in the next couple of days and I'll look at it. I'll sign it if it's what you say it is. And they sent it in. I signed the order. And that was the end of it. There are some ancillary issues that had to be decided. There was land that was on the other side of Mar Marlin Avenue that was vacant and had been already cleared in the previous excavation with I-485. They didn't know what they wanted to do with that, so the DOT turned that over to DeKalb County to be a park. Strange. So a year later, I was signing an order dismissing the case because it had been settled. So there are other things about the case that are kind of interesting afterwards. Thirty years later, I get a call from what is now called the Old Senate Park Society. And they say, Judge, you remember the Parkway case? Oh, yeah, a little bit. And they said, well, you know, we've got all kinds of people who have moved into Druid Hills. So I have no idea where the parks came from. And uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to make a presentation. You know, to us and to people would be invited. We're having a kind of a Olmstead festival where we'd have you park, and we're going to have representatives of, representatives of caution. Those people are demonstrating, you know, they're, but I may not have mentioned there were demonstrations going on all during this park. People were chaining themselves with trucks and they're cutting down trees and everything else. And they were going to have, they were going to be there, and there was going to be another, and there would be a representative from the city of Atlanta. And so they invited me, and a county, former county commissioner, Gail, uh, what was Gail's last name? I cannot recall. She also wanted to be heard. So then I told them the story. There's one thing I'd like to tell you about a kind of a strange thing that happened uh, before the parkway was adopted. It was the strangest case, issue. During some of these demonstrations that were taking place, and this was probably before I knew I even had the case, it was March or April, and the demonstrations taking place, and there were city councilmen and legislators being arrested, chaining themselves to trees and the like, and they were all arrested by the city of Atlanta. And I read about it, and I read about it, and anyway, they went down, they, they had taken down to the DeKalb County Jail. And one of the people who represented him was a legal aid lawyer by the name of Gary LaShaw. He's a kind of a friend of mine. I'd known him for years. And he called me and he said, he never really has respect or privacy. He said, Chuck, I got a problem. And he said, well, go ahead, Gary. What's the problem? Well, you know, we've posted bond for all of the people who are arrested. And, but, the, but the jailer won't let them out. 
So what did he say? Well, he's not going to release him unless he gets the permission of a DeKalb County Superior Court judge. I said, what? what's that about? I mean, he, I have no authority over it, and neither does any other DeKalb County judge. He said, because it was, because it was all city of Atlanta, and uh, his ordinances had been violated. So he said, well, give me, give me the phone number and I'll call him. So I gave him the phone number and I called him and said, Chief, and I don't remember his name now, says, this is Judge Seeliger, Cab County Superior Court. And those people you arrested over there uh, on the Presidential Parkway demonstrations, you can let them go. He said, what? I said, you can let them go. Are you really a judge? I said, well, yeah, well, let me give you my phone number. So he called my secretary, the secretary, of course, and Judge Seneca Chambers, and transferred the call into me. Well, I guess you're really a judge. You want me to let him go, huh? I said, yeah, if you don't mind. He said, all right. That was the end of it. And that was before anything started with the presidential property. Later, I did assign the case. I, what a, quite a coincidence. Uh, thereafter, though, as I was mentioning earlier, they invited me over to explain it because so many people were new generation had moved in that. After all, this was 30 years after when the thing took place when they had me come over and speak. And they kind of gave me a little award, the Olmstead Public Service Award. It was a little plaque with an etched show you Olmstead Park. Funny. 30 years after the fact. So, how long did you? Were you involved in the case altogether? 1985 to 1991. So it'd be about six years. Oh, okay. That's a long time. And it became ultimately a two lane road. Mm -hmm. But do you remember how big it was proposed to be? It was supposed to be a four lane freeway. Four lane freeway. Okay. And, uh, the way it was designed, if anyone who goes over there and looks at the Freedom Parkway, you'll see uh, it goes through all kinds of clues, it goes through all kinds of curves and around hills, all of the dead, dead and sound. So if anybody had any trucks riding in this very secure to ride, I don't know why any truck driver would want to take it, you couldn't hear it. And the dispute when it finally ended because they were fighting over a stop sign at the beginning of the parkway down in, in the city of Atlanta. This was explained to me. And the DOT came up with a solution. They gave it, they put a, what they were, what the caution people were afraid of is that they're going to put a stop sign there and the trucks to get started have to start and make a huge amount of noise. So they arranged to have the, that there be no Set, there'd be no uh, uh, stoplight at the beginning of the road. So whenever it goes through, and that was apparently what hung them up before and what they weren't able to set up. Mm -hmm. And of course it was named the Freedom Parkway. Uh, and I still remember the dedication. Uh, they were gonna dedicate the parkway and I wasn't invited, but I got quoted in the paper saying, look at that, that has been part of my life for six years. I'm gonna go there and see this dedication. She said, really believe it's over. And so I went there and saw Jimmy Carter was there and all these other people there. And I kind of sat in the back of the crowd. Uh, Phil Campbell, who was mayor at the time, saw that I was there. And he had to decide whether he would bring me up to the front or not. But this is such a huge, huge, disputed road. He didn't think he'd want to do that. So he kind of waved at me and I kind of waved back. That was where it, that's where it ended. I went there with my locker, Carol Miller, man. Uh, strange, mm -hmm. strange story. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it worked out very, very well. I'm really proud <coughs> that they named it after my friend John Lewis. Couldn't be better. And of course it runs, and <coughs> they call it the Freedom Parkway because the Parkway runs from the Martin Luther King Center, you should about walk from it up to the Carter Library. Mm. It's really appropriate. Mm. Thank you so much um, for covering that really big case that was part of your life for so many years.
Um, I'd like to focus now on your work with the Georgia Commission on Family Violence. How did you get How did you get started um, with that with that group, and what kinds of things? Well, I've been involved in the issue of domestic violence for several years before that took place. I was uh, my first involvement actually was in 1989. I was invited down by the legislature to comment on a bill uh, setting up the temporary protective orders. Uh, and as a judge, and and uh, they wanted to have my opinion on it. And because I, and I also had a kind of an opinion about uh, the bill itself. So I went down to a legislative committee and that testified. And they asked me what he thought about the bill. I think it works fine, but the burden of proof is too lot is too heavy. I think a lot of applicants for a temporary protective order uh, would, would fail to make their case because of the way that language is constructed. Now the language on that particular order said uh, that family violence had occurred and will occur in the future. Well, of course, no judge can predict that. So I asked him to just change a few words and make that you know, family violence has occurred and may occur in the future. And the legislature, legislature uh, delegation bought it and that became law. And actually, it was a funny thing, almost uh, 25 years later, the case, that language became tested before the Court of Appeals uh, from, from out of Gwinnett County. I was really amazed. I didn't think anybody would try to change, but an enterprising defense lawyer said, no, Mark, you can't put that protective order up against my client because there's no guarantee he's going to commit this crime. And so it went up to the Supreme Court, uh, Court of Appeals, they looked at it, and they said, no, that language is good. If it says it may happen in the future, that's enough to, for the issuance of a temporary, uh, temporary protective order. And thereafter, uh, Karen Hunstein was the first the chair of the DeKalb Commission, uh, uh, Committee Against Domestic Violence. And they asked, and when Carol was ele elevated to the Supreme Court, she asked me if I would take the job. And I said, okay. So I had it, and I had it for about two years. But Deborah McDorman was the person who actually ran it. She was an investigator for the uh, uh, solicitor's office. And she did all the paperwork, organizing and bringing people in. I'd conduct the meetings and try to keep order. But apparently, they felt the commission thought it was really important that I be there because I was a judge. And a judge heading up a commission like that gives it a lot more weight in the eyes of law enforcement, defense, defense counsel, legislatures, and the like. So I didn't get that job necessarily out of my own merit, but they really needed a judge who kind of agreed on the issue of domestic violence. Two years later, I um, got a call from, uh, from, from the present, one of the present members of the, of the commission. His name was Rick Bathrick, and he was the director of Men's Stopping Violence in DeKalb County. He said, Chuck, I'd like you to consider being a member of the commission, of, uh, on the commission of uh, state commission on family violence. Uh, what do you think about that? I said, sure, I don't mind. So we all showed up down at the uh, at the governor's office and all took the, you know, were sworn in by, uh, see, I don't remember who it was, uh, who it was, somebody from the governor's office who was all in. And everybody just kind of gathered around and they said, well, uh, who wants to be chair? And nobody said anything. Well, I'd like to know, and Dick said, I'll nominate Judge Seeliger. Dick, what are you doing? And he said, yeah, yeah, we like that. So I became the chair, <laughs> just like that. And then we started conducting meetings. Now the commission it was not very strong at that point. Uh, it was heaven, but it was composed of people from the legislature who very seldom attend meetings. Uh, 
representatives of each judicial district to have a judge or a representative, police officers and the police officers and representatives of uh, organizations like Men's Stop and Violence and Women's Resource Center with people with victims of domestic violence. And so when I came aboard, I kind of had to bring a little bit of order to it. We had a full-time uh, commissioner at that time. Uh, she was very good. Uh, I just can't think of her name right offhand. But she, but almost, almost six months after I got the job, she said, well, I'm leaving, I'm going to law school. I said, oh, great. So they brought in a successor, we interviewed it. She was very good as well. And so we had a series of good directors while I served on the commission. And I actually served as chair of the commission for six years. I, you're only supposed to serve on the commission for two years, and then wash out. But nobody could make up their minds about who they wanted to replace me. So I just hung on. Until finally, after about, as I said, six years, I, I announced that I would not be, I would not stand any further. I would resign as chair, but I would continue on the commission. And uh, I brought in uh, uh, Judge Bass from Savannah uh, to serve as the chair, and I served on the commission for another two years, and then I came on. So you were part of the organization for about eight years? Yeah. In two years of share, six years of share. And can you talk a little bit about what kinds of things were discussed at meetings? Were you trying to change legislation? Were you working with, you said police officers were part of the, the all, group. Of, <clears throat> all of that. Uh -huh. uh, it was a political football, first of all. It, nobody really wanted to deal with the commission. The uh, Governor uh, Zell Miller uh, didn't like the way the commission was advocating for legislation uh, and thought they were a little bit too powerful. And, and it was at that point, under the auspices of the Judicial Council and Superior Court judges, and he, he didn't like that. He kind of had a version for judges against judges. And so he thought they had too much power in the legislature. So he took that office away from them and argued that we should be under the Department of Public, uh, under the Public Human Services, which the commission had been un under before and had not done well. It became a place where they would be in the, the several agencies, like the Women's Resource Center and other agencies that deal with violence. Would, dealing with violence and, and counseling for them got into battles over money because they also, the Department of Human Resources, also disperse money to shelters all over the state of Georgia. But then, and so the next thing is, well, how about they recommended, well, how uh, the governor said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to let you go back to the Judicial Council, but if you want to go over to, you can go over to the, the uh, Department of Public Health, Public Health or Health Department, or you can go over to the Department of Corrections. And I said, okay, we'll go to the Department of Corrections. And so we became part of the Department of Corrections. And since then, it's been re resumed back to where it should have been with the judges. Uh, that, but that worked out well. We adopted several new laws, amending the temporary protective order law. Uh, we became a certifier for people who do counseling in domestic relations cases, a certifier for counseling to help counseling for, for uh, organizations like Men's Stopping Violence, uh, get certifications for so social workers and that kind of thing. So it became an operating agency dealing with domestic violence. And it's done very well and continues to do well. It was a lot more political with me because we were fighting to, to get a recommendation you know, have a posture of rec recognition from both the state government and from the legislature. We finally got that, and with that came in really, I was not much help to him. I'm not a very good administrator, so I decided to turn it over to somebody else, somebody else. And I've gotten a lot of awards for it. I would probably <clears throat> the one that I appreciate the most is from the Women's Resource Center, and that award is for uh, they have named an award for advocates for domestic against domestic violence. 
They get their judge seat to go to war, and they give that out every year. And it's an honor in itself. So. The last thing I'd like for you to talk about is this photograph. It depicts the place where the obelisk uh, used to stand in Decatur Square. Yeah. So when you talk about your the order that had that obelisk removed in June 2020, is that right? That is That's correct. June 2020. Actually, that was a fairly easy decision to make. Previously, uh, before the instance developed, the city of the Half County Commission wanted to remove the monument. They just wanted to get rid of it. But there was that provision in the Georgia law that says that you cannot remove it unless you can find another suitable location for it and preserve it. Or otherwise, you can't move it. So they were stuck. Nobody wanted the monument, they couldn't get rid of it. So the city of the uh, the city of Decatur got really concerned with the demonstrations that were taking place from around it. Uh, men stopped from uh, Black Men's Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement was there. We started hearing words of Sons of the Confederacy and uh, some of the uh, other very conservative racist organizations were involved in it. And there were demonstrations being held out in front of the in front of the courthouse and run that monument, which I'm sure you're familiar with because you were here when it happened. And so finally, the city said, look, we're, at, we're coming before you to declare uh, this, uh, this monument a public nuisance because of the potential of violence. And they argued that it was going to become like Charlottesville, that is to say, the demonstrations and potential violence around that monument, so it had to come down. And I listened to the argument, and both sides in agreement. So I said, all right, I agree with you. What you told me satisfies the, my, the evident, evidentiary portion of declaring it a nuisance, and I will declare it a nuisance and order it to be removed. And then I asked the party, so is there anything you disagree with? And the city said, no, yeah, we want it down now. And the city said, the county said, yeah, we want it down too, but we will need some time. They rolled their head. I said, all right, I'll give you two weeks to do it down. And meanwhile, you have to assure me that the monument will be not be destroyed, and it'll be preserved, and it'll be removed in a safe place. And that when the removal takes place, that the sheriff's department and the Cap County and the Decatur Cap County uh, Police Department and the Decatur Police Department will be there to provide security for the people that's going to remove the monument. But you've got a period of time to do it. Now, one of the reasons I did it in that time was that I kind of anticipated somebody would come in and challenge the order. So I wanted them to give it time to do it before the monuments were torn down. It took about a week and a half. And we then tore it down and we heard nothing from any either side. And so that night, which happened to be the night before Juneteenth, I think is what it was, uh, they came in and tore it down. And that was the end of it. It's in a warehouse somewhere that the Cab County has. The latest development is long since, since I've left the bench, is that my successor has received a petition and have sons of the Confederacy to restore the monument. Well, of course, it's now been removed. They had ten, they had at least a week or so to object when the order was issued before the monument was removed. They did not. So in my personal opinion, not an opinion of the judges can be decided, they waived any right to raise any objection at this point. But it was really kind of interesting because when I ordered it removed, I received three phone calls. All three were intercepted by my secretary, complaining about incision. One was from a representative of the Science of the Confederacy. Uh, one was from uh, a couple of judges down in South Georgia. And that was it. Got no threats or anything else. Compared to what happened 40 years before when I removed the flag, when I received death threats over and over again, and there was a huge uproar. 
This the reaction to this was relatively mild. Quite a difference from reactions. I think it says good things about our society too. I think so too. Yeah. Thank you, Judge Seeliger. We will stop the recording there.